This week on Christian World News, in Nigeria, violent conflicts and persecution have forced millions of Christians from their homes. See how they're struggling to survive and how you can join with churches around the world to pray for the persecuted. Plus, in the U.S., historic injustice nearly destroyed Native American culture. Learn how one tribe is restoring its faith and heritage with the Word of God. And prayers for the next president. How an Illinois church is sending encouragement to America's next leader before the election is even decided. And welcome everyone to Christian World News. I'm Wendy Griffith. My co-anchor George Thomas is off. Well, in sub-Saharan Africa, 16 million Christians have fled their homes due to violence and conflict. Pastor Barnabas and thousands of others live in one, in one of many displaced people camps in Nigeria after fleeing Muslim extremists. This report by Open Doors UK comes to us from our friends at the Global News Alliance. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. God bless you all. Amen. Uh, as we can see, this is church. I'm a pastor, and this is well, the people I pastor, I pastor them. As we are gathered here, how many of us fled due to the attacks? Raise up your hands. Pastor Barnabas's church in Nigeria is a makeshift structure inside a camp for internally displaced people, or IDPs. The people he pastors are Christians who were violently forced from their homes by militant Fulani herdsmen. Here is my house where I live together with my wife, my seven children. Uh, three of them stayed here with me and my wife. Then the rest of the children joined, joined up my neighbor to stay away this night. When day breaks, they come back and stay with me. This tent here is uh, from here to this place is one and a half meters. From here to here is one and a half meters. From here to here is one and a half meters. It's smaller than the, uh, a double uh, mattress. The suffering of these displaced Christians is so tough that many of them have begun to lose their faith in God. When I see my people living in this kind of condition we, we are, I feel very bad. It makes many of them begin to lose their faith from God. They begin to turn away from God. But with God, we believe that God will still restore them back. This has been my prayer for them in the name of Jesus. Others, like Barnabas, remain faithful to Christ, despite the severe hardships of life here. They worship God, ask for more of his Holy Spirit, and trust him for their future. For the place we are living, my prayer is that one day, God Almighty, we ask that God should restore us back to our ancestral homes. We will not remain suffering the way we are suffering. God lives, and as he lives, he will surely see us through. He is everything that we are. He will never disappoint, and he has never disappointed us. No matter of the condition we are into, so far our eyes is on him. So far is our hope is on him. We put all confidence on him. We believe he's great. He will do it more than what we have not even expected. Extraordinary faith. Well, every year on this first Sunday in November, Christians around the world join in prayer for the persecuted church. Joining us now is Jeff King, president of International Christian Concern, to tell us more about the global persecution and this day of prayer. Jeff, welcome to Christian World News. Wayne, good to be with you. 
Jeff, this situation in Nigeria, uh, wow, I, that was incredible to watch. But their faith is also incredible, and it's largely unreported. This is the first time hearing about it. Tell us, tell us why Christians are being so attacked there in Nigeria. Well, and if I can, let me back up a little and give people the scale of what's happening. Um, and as you said, it's so underreported, it's crazy. But in the last 20 years, uh, probably up to about 100,000 Christians have been killed. No one knows the real number, but that's a, a number I use. Uh, and then three and a half million Christian farmers have had their land stolen. So like in so many places in Africa, this is an Islamist agenda, radical Islamist agenda, an attack. It's a slow moving genocide. It is a stealth jihad. And uh, basically what happens is, you know, the, the radical the radicals will come into a village, shoot it up, machete everybody, drive it out, take the land. That's the, the simple understanding of what happens. And it's day in, day out. And it never gets fixed. And here's this is the most interesting thing. 20 years, they never go after the gorillas, hardly ever. Uh, they can't be found somehow even though this is happening on the scale I mentioned. And that's because the Islamists are in the government. So they're controlling the police, the army, and the intel agencies. It's a scale, the scale that's happening is just unbelievable. Yeah, hard to go after them if they are in the government, as you said. Well, yeah. uh, Jeff, persecution varies in different parts of the world. Explain the different ways Christians are targeted worldwide. Yeah. Well, and this is probably my biggest point to Christians and to help them even what's going on in the West is to understand what, what does the dictator do? What does the despot do to strangle the church? And it's really simple because they'll almost always say we have religious freedom in our country. Now, what that means is that you can't you just don't bring it in the public square. If you want to if you want to turn to Christ in your own mind, if you're not going to share it, if you're not going to spread scriptures or the message, that's fine. We won't have a problem. You bring it into the public square, that's a problem, and you're going to be attacked. And you can then something happens along this spectrum of you'll be hated and uh, treated culturally in a negative way, up to murder, uh, rape, torture, imprisonment, assassination. Um, but so the same thing, that dynamic that's happening all over the world, we're now seeing in the West, and it's even moved into the United States. We have religious freedom. Don't bring it into the public square. Jeff, this is the day, November 1st. Millions around the world will be praying for the persecuted church. Tell us more about how uh, people can take part. Well, boy, oh boy, I tell you what, there's, we have uh, persecution.org we've set up, and some of the org other organizations have it too, where we have a kit where basically a church can put on a persecution service on any Sunday. So if they haven't done it already, it's probably too late, but if you're a pastor, it's like, first of all, pray. Go on to one of the big sites like persecution.org or one of the other ministries. Find some stories. Get your people to understand what's going on and pray. And, and the biggest thing I say to pastors is that, oh, my gosh, when you just called it when we're listening to the Nigerian brother, what, how invigorating it is to our faith. They will revolutionize your faith, but we need to start with prayer and then move beyond that. Jeff, Iran is in the news a lot lately, of course, because of the fighting in the Middle East. Tell us about the growing church there and the dangers it faces. Yeah, when it, one of my favorite questions, I tell you what, what a story, and it's the Lord's story. So if, if a person is a, of any age, they're going to remember the Ayatollah coming in and taking over, and they've ruled the country for decades now. Now, most people have no idea because they, they're just familiar with the state and the bad actors that are running the place. But the populace has turned away from them. These are the most brutal, horrendous people. And that's especially towards the church. So they have murdered, uh, destroyed, raped their way through the church. And they put people in prison. And, and it's said that what they're doing, really, it's so satanic because they're not just trying to punish. They're trying to break people at a very fundamental level. So that's the Ayatollahs and that's the system. But here's the crazy thing is that the populace has turned away. They said, boy, if this is Islam, we want no part of it. And, and so the mosques are largely empty. The old are still there, but all the young have left. And the crazy, the craziest thing is that the church has exploded. Uh, you know, one pastor told me, he said, you know, I go into a party and I say, hey, everybody, I'm a Christian. If you'd like to talk about Jesus or Christianity, come over and talk to me in the corner. 
and he says, I'm mobbed for four or five hours. You know, when he, in the dark, the one who has the light is mobbed. In the desert, whoever has the canteen, everyone will gather around. That is the story of Iran. It's And it's scriptural. It's said in the end days that Iran would come to know the Lord. It's happening right before our eyes. I can tell that's your favorite story to tell. All right, Jeff King of International Christian Concern, thank you so much for joining us. God bless. Wonderful. Thank you. Up next, overcoming historic injustice. See how one Native American tribe is preserving its faith and culture through its commitment to the Word of God. Welcome back to Christian World News. For more than 150 years, the federal government forced Native American children into boarding schools. There they faced isolation, abuse, and were deprived of their culture. Many never saw their families again. Well, recently, President Joe Biden apologized for the destruction of their cultures. In Oklahoma, a sovereign tribe with deep Christian roots is witnessing a revival. As CBN's Brody Carter reports, the Choctaw community is using scripture in their native language to preserve both faith and heritage. Oklahoma is home to 39 Native American nations. We're currently overlooking one of the largest tribal lands, the Choctaw Nation, where the people here have a rich history of Christianity interwoven into its culture. And now as part of a larger effort to bring the Bible to every language, a dedicated few are translating scripture into their native tongue, a continuation of a legacy that began in the 1800s. John 3, 16, Chihuayat, Yakti Ainulofinakat. At Grace Indian Baptist Church in Tallahena, Oklahoma, Pastor Raymond Johnson plays a vital role in the Choctaw translation effort. The Choctaw Bible is about 25 years worth of work, and the Choctaw hymn book took us eight years to get this. The reason why it took so long because it was uh, nobody got paid to do it. Johnson is a curator, collecting Choctaw scriptures and hymns, while his brother-in-law, Clifford Ludlow, translates the text. Working together with the Global Bible Society, their labor of love helped create this King James Choctaw Bible, bringing the language to a new generation. But the more they read it, I do feel like that they could and look at the English part and then go back and forth just like. As the Choctaw language faces modern challenges, there's a deeper significance to the translation work. We were not allowed to speak our language. We were forbidden. We were put in boarding schools, all those types of things. Choctaw Nation Chief Gary Batten says tribe members have only been able to speak their language since 1979, when they ratified their constitution. Most people don't know that Native Americans weren't allowed to vote until the 60s. Christianity within the tribe dates back more than 200 years. Introduced by the Presbyterian Church, it became a foundation of strength in 1829 when then-President Andrew Jackson forced them from their homeland as part of the Trail of Tears. Today, the Choctaw Nation spans 11,000 square miles in southeastern Oklahoma, still standing strong in its faith, as declared by Chief Batten after his inauguration in 2014. I see movement happening because I feel like we're embracing Christianity. We're closer, I think, than ever to God because everywhere you go throughout the Choctaw Nation, you know it's okay. You're within a Christian nation. It's okay to pray. It's, all, it's okay to share your faith. In helping make the Choctaw Bible more accessible, the YouVersion Bible app has digitized two Choctaw translations in partnership with the British and Foreign Bible Society. It's difficult for us in English to sort of fully appreciate um, what it would be like if the Bible was not available in our heart language, because we've always had it available in our heart language. Uversion founder and CEO Bobby Grunewald understands the importance and sees the potential of making these translations available. When you have an app that is opened 270 times every second, and it's in, you know, 70 plus languages, the Bible itself in over 2,000 languages, um, there's a scope and complexity to it that's not obvious to people when they use it. But we believe it's just the start. I mean, the team will probably double or even triple in size over the next several years. But um, we're humble to be a part of something God's doing and, and love to have others join us. For Pastor Raymond Johnson and his small congregation, this connection with Scripture is a spiritual lifeline that ties the Choctaw people to their faith, culture, and history. Well, your language is your identity. At this point in history, I think we have less than 500 fluent speakers uh, in the Choctaw Nation, and we have probably about 250,000 on our membership role. And so it's, it's, it's dying. Hopefully the team effort to translate the Bible can help resurrect the Choctaw language and ensure the Christian faith will be passed down for generations to come.
Brody Carter, CBN News. Thanks, Brody. Coming up, as America elects a new president, a church is writing thousands of letters, sending prayers and encouragement to the winner, no matter who it is. Welcome back. This week, Americans are electing a new president. One Illinois church wants to encourage the next occupant of the White House with prayer. Members have written thousands of letters in advance, lifting up the new president, regardless of who wins. CBN's Charlene Aaron has the story. Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois, launched the letter writing campaign as part of its series, Prayers for the Next President. Leaders felt compelled by the biblical command to pray for those in authority and add that only positive letters will be sent to the White House. There's these people who are running for something called president, and this leadership position is so heavy. Megan Fate Marshman, teaching pastor at Willow Creek, hopes to ease that load by leading her congregation to pray for the country's next president. I remember when the idea was pitched, we found ourselves thinking about what God's word leads us to do, which I'll tell you where this came from. First Timothy chapter two, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for, here it is, all people, not just those you agree with. Those attending the church's multiple campuses have written more than 11,000 letters, which will be mailed after the election. And someone in that position holding that type of pressure and having half the world hate you, man, they're going to need prayer to hold the mantle. Marshman shares this letter from a high school student. Dear President, you are trusted and you are loved not just by the American people, but by God, to do what is right. That's what you're trusted to do. I can only imagine the infinite criticism and pressure, the pain that you will suffer through, but through it all, your power is a vessel of hope to bring unity, peace, and humility to this world. The pastor sees this as proof of God's spirit moving in the life of a church that wants to follow his heart for the nation's leader, despite political differences. It is a sentiment National Association of Evangelicals President Walter Kim applauds, especially as divisions abound, even within the church. I think um, if we can incorporate the admonitions that we find throughout scriptures, to love our enemy, to pray for those who persecute us, to recognize that we, we've we been called the people of God, sent to proclaim this gospel of peace to the world. Meanwhile, Regent University Dean of Theology, Dr. Corne Becker, offers this wisdom for believers. If our person doesn't win the election, this is the time to really press into prayer. Firstly, we can pray that God can turn the heart of these folks that have been elected in. And secondly, we can continue to pray for revival to happen within our land. But it's pivotal that we need to show civility and respect. As the Apostle Paul says, let no corrupt communication come out of our mouth, but that every word be seasoned with grace. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Great idea. Well, you can get Christian World News delivered straight to your inbox to sign up for our weekly email update. Just go to cbnworldnews.com, cbnworldnews.com. We'll be right back. Finally this week, bluegrass music continues to see a resurgence with an estimated 20 million Americans calling themselves fans. While this mountain genre can trace its history to Scots-Irish American immigrants, it's still reaching younger generations. CBN's Lori Johnson introduces us to one rising star who credits God for her success. At just 10 years old, Carly Arrowwood fell in love with the fiddle. Now, at age 28, she's considered one of the best bluegrass fiddlers around. I feel it going home, coming on. Carly has also earned the triple threat title, recognizing her as an outstanding musician, singer, and songwriter, while already racking up numerous awards in her young career. 
I'm very blessed just right out the gate. It's like he, all of these, I don't know, accomplishments and things that I've been able to do through the years is just um, a testament to the Lord's faithfulness. She and her band play various forms of bluegrass, including Christian. Bluegrass gospel is pretty popular um, throughout the bluegrass music scene. You know, we're very passionate about our gospel music, and it's important for us to, you know, let people know that the Lord loves them and that He calls them out of their sin and into the right way to live, and that's to, to glorify Jesus and know that He died for their sins. She's part of a new generation. We are blessed to have a lot of friends our age in it that are also believers and are also, you know, passionate about it like we are. Carly and her band play instruments made by Christian craftsmen like this Hooper guitar. They all have 1 Corinthians 1031 engraved on the neck block. Do all to the glory of God. Carly plays a fiddle fashioned by Bob Cogat, who prays over each instrument that it will be used to further the kingdom of God. I guess that's why I got the fiddle, so. <laughs> Carly's songwriting reflects her faith walk. When you're saved, he calls you and you're his, and he, he chooses you and you're his forever. Carly hopes fans worldwide will hear that message in both her live performances and recordings. I pray that whoever listens to it, whether they're our age or younger or older, you know, that it comes across and that, that it pierces their hearts or that the Lord pierces their hearts with it. And while that remains her primary focus, Carly does have her eyes on a secondary goal. It'd be nice to play the Opry one day. I, I don't know if that'll ever happen. It's just whatever the Lord decides. So remember the name and faith of Carly Arrowwood as more people discover this rising bluegrass sensation. Lori Johnson, CBN News, Newton, North Carolina. Carly Arrowwood, we won't be forgetting her name anytime soon. And I'm from West Virginia, so you know I love that kind of music. Well, thanks for joining us this week. Until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, goodbye and God bless you.